Hey everyone and welcome. This is Commander Ray Ford with FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research Small Business and Industry Assistance Program, also known as Cedar SBIA. We're very excited to have you join us today for our extended presentation, Deeper Dive Webinar, Post-Marketing Drug Safety and Inspection Readiness. The webinar will be posted in its entirety, both video and audio, on our website within five days. And that website is fda.gov forward slash Cedar SBIA webinars. Before we begin, I would like to cover some details. Slides for today's presentation are available from your screen in that middle box where it says download presentations here. This activity has been pre-approved by reps as eligible for up to four credits toward your participants RAC recertification. You'll be able to obtain the attendance certificate only upon completion of the survey which will remain open for two weeks. That means it will close on July 3rd. We acknowledge that due to the high registration for today's event, some individuals may not gain access to the live webinar. As such, for this event only, we will honor viewing the recording as qualifying for the RAC CEs, provided that you view the webinar and complete the survey within the next two weeks. Even if you don't need a certificate, we'd appreciate it if you let us know your comments and feedback via the survey. To outline today's event, the webinar in its entirety will run approximately four hours. We'll have three sessions with two Q&A panels, one in the AM and one in the PM. We'll break for 15 minutes between sessions one and two. After session two, we'll break for 45 minutes for lunch and resume at 12.45 for our third and final session. We invite you to submit questions throughout the presentations, identifying the relevant speaker. Our first session will discuss postmarking adverse drug experience inspections. And our first speaker is Kelly Sims, PharmD, MS, BCPS, Commander, United States Public Health Service, Consumer Safety Officer, Paid Compliance Team, Office of Scientific Investigations, Office of Compliance. So let's begin. Welcome, Commander Sims. Thank you, Commander Ford. First, the paid compliance team will present to you about paid inspections. The presentation will be followed by the REMS compliance team presenting to you about REMS inspections. And the final session from our post-marketing compliance team will discuss readiness for our program's inspections. Thank you all for joining us today. The PAIC Compliance Team will now begin by talking to you about the post-marketing, drug safety, and our inspections. It's important to note that throughout the presentations and day-to-day -day business, you might hear the term PAID, or see the acronym P-A-D-E, and that stands for Post-Marketing Adverse Drug Experience. Over the next hour, we'll discuss a number of important topics, such as paid laws and regulations, written procedures, what we look for in contracts or agreements with business partners, and electronic reporting. After lunch in session three, you'll learn or you'll hear how this information ties into preparing for paid inspections. We hope by the end of our presentations that you will gain an understanding of the paid laws and regulations. You will better understand the process for our inspections. You'll better understand how FDA uses the inspection information and you'll be able to take this information and think about some best practices. Please note for today's presentation, we're using the term unapproved non-prescription products interchangeably with over-the-counter or OTC monograph products. As Commander Ford stated, my name is Kelly Sims and I am one of the consumer safety officers on the paid compliance team. I'm going to briefly introduce you to the paid laws and regulations. As background, the United States Congress passes laws and amendments to update the laws. The Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act prescribes the laws that need to be followed for the paid compliance program. Individual agencies like the FDA interpret the laws and describe how they'll be enforced by implementing regulations. For the paid program, Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations, or CFR, describes who is responsible for complying with the laws and what they have to do. FDA also issues guidance documents. 
that provide information about how to comply with the laws and regulations. The guidance documents are not legally binding, but they represent FDA's current thinking. Both laws and regulations are enforceable, and we look for compliance with these during inspections. For reference, we've included three slides of laws and regulations that we refer to for post-marketing safety activities. This first slide may be referenced for prescription human drug products laws and regulations. The second slide may be referenced for approved human biologic products laws and regulations. And this third slide may be referenced for OTC monograph or unapproved non-prescription human drug product laws. <coughs> And I'm now going to turn the microphone over to Diane Bruce, PharmD, who's a member of the paid compliance team. Thank you, Commander Sims. Hello, I'm Diane Bruce, a member of the paid team. And we're now going to move on to our first topic, which is written procedures. Paid written procedures are required by law for all approved NDA, ANDA, BLA, and unapproved prescription drug products. They are not required for OTC monograph products, but are still considered a best practice. Please pay attention to the requirements for written procedures. Many of the recent paid warning letters have been issued for failure to develop adequate written procedures. All paid laws and regulations, including those for written procedures and aggregate report submission, apply to any approved drug product. A product is considered approved until officially withdrawn from the Federal Register. During recent paid inspections, several firms have been surprised to learn that they must have written procedures even if they do not yet market or have ceased to market their approved drug products. Written procedures must address adverse drug experience, surveillance, receipt, evaluation, and reporting. Most written procedures exist in the form of SOPs, but FDA will also review written procedures contained in pharmacovigilance contracts and agreements. If steps in the post-marketing ADE reporting process are outsourced, the application holder remains responsible for compliance and should have written procedures in place that reflect the outsourced processes. Written procedures should reflect the firm's current practices. The paid team has identified that many observations listed on FDA Forms 483 are rooted in inadequate written procedures. We will discuss each of these steps in more detail in this session. The first section that we will break down in paid written procedures is surveillance. A firm must have written procedures to monitor for adverse drug experiences. Adverse drug experiences, or ADEs, are any adverse events associated with the use of a drug in humans, regardless of whether the firm considers the adverse event to be drug-related and whether it is ultimately submitted to FDA. ADEs can include drug overdose, drug abuse, drug withdrawal, and a lack of drug effect. ADEs are valid and reportable to FDA when a firm can identify a patient, a suspect drug, an adverse event, and an identifiable reporter. If a firm cannot identify all four data elements of a valid ADE, the firm should endeavor to obtain the missing information so that it can submit a valid ADE. When a firm receives additional information on an already submitted valid ADE, the new report is called a follow-up ADE. Please note that an ADE can be either spontaneously reported to the firm without the firm prompting or solicited, studied, by the firm. A firm must address surveillance for both spontaneous and solicited ADEs. As you review and develop written procedures, you should consider whether your written procedures address monitoring for all sources of spontaneous ADEs. For example, 
Do you monitor foreign sources of ADEs in addition to domestic? Do the procedures address surveillance in all departments within your firm that may come into contact with ADEs? The legal department, the operators of firm-sponsored social media sites, and the tech team responding to contact us boxes, for example, can all encounter ADEs. Do you review complaint reports and lack of effect reports for ADEs? Do you receive ADEs from patients, relatives, and healthcare providers? Do your written procedures account for reconciliation with all specialty pharmacies that dispense your products? Do you have contracts in place to regularly reconcile ADEs with or audit business partners to ensure that you are receiving any and all ADEs that they receive. Business partners will be discussed in more detail later in this presentation. Does your sales team have a written procedures for how to recognize and report potential ADEs when they discuss your products with doc doctors and hospitals? Do you search scientific literature? What search criteria do you use to ensure that you find all ADEs reportable by you? Do you search by active moiety rather than brand name? These are just a few of the many, many sources that you will need to consider. What can happen when you don't consider all possible sources? For example, a firm audited a specialty pharmacy and discovered thousands of unreported ADEs. This firm is now working very hard to bring itself into compliance. ADEs can also be solicited by the firm. Solicited, or study, ADEs can come from several sources, such as some patient support programs, patient registries, epi epidemiological studies, phase four studies, host marketing studies, and IND studies. The paid team has seen firms with INDs for new indications for already marketed products fail to submit ADEs found in the IND trial to the already approved application. As your firm develops written procedures, it should pay careful attention to sources of study ADEs and which teams in your firm may be coming into contact with these ADEs. Do your written procedures ensure your firm identifies all post-marketing studies? Do the written procedures allow you to review all post-marketing studies? What can happen when you don't monitor for solicited ADEs? For example, a firm recently audited its foreign patient support program and discovered hundreds of thousands of unreported ADEs dating back over 10 years. It is now working very hard to bring itself into compliance. The second topic that paid written procedures must cover is receipt of ADEs. Once you identify an ADE or follow-up information for an ADE from any source, you need to receive the ADE or follow-up information and record your receipt. Written procedures should ensure that as many ADEs as possible that are received are valid and contain the four elements necessary to be reportable to FDA. If you do not obtain all four data elements, for example, perhaps a patient emails you an incomplete ADE, then your firm should have written procedures to follow up on the invalid ADE. Be sure to document your follow-up attempts. In addition to obtaining the four elements of a reportable ADE, your firm should have adequate written procedures to identify and record the initial receive date. This is the day that you or anyone acting on your behalf receives an ADE. This means that if your legal team receives an email after hours on Friday, does not open the email until Tuesday, and does not send it to you until Saturday, your firm must record Friday as the receive date. Correctly identifying the initial date of receipt is critical because expedited report due dates are calculated based off this date. When developing written procedures, your firm should consider whether you reconcile with partners frequently enough 
to ensure that all ADEs can be received timely. As you can see, in the middle of this slide's graphic, written procedures must ensure proper documentation of all aspects of ADE receipt. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Namita Kotari, and she will continue with evaluation. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Namita Kotari, and I'm also a consumer safety officer on the paid compliance team. I'm going to pick up where we left off and talk about how to evaluate ADEs and what written procedures should address. <clears throat> There are three main factors to evaluate for each ADE. The first factor is seriousness. An adverse event is considered serious if it results in one or more of the outcomes listed on this slide. Please note that the other serious, important medical events are based on medical judgment and include events that may jeopardize the patient or require intervention. The second factor is expectedness. If the adverse event is not currently in the is not in the currently approved U.S. product label, it is considered unexpected. Additionally, events that are more severe or more specific than what is described in the label are also considered unexpected. <clears throat> the third factor is relatedness. As you heard earlier, firms may receive solicited ADEs from organized data collection programs such as studies and registries. For ADEs from, so from solicited sources, Firms must assess whether or not they think the event is possibly related to the drug. The factors discussed on the previous slide impact how ADEs are reported to FDA. Firms report ADEs to FDA in Individual Case Safety Reports, or ICSRs. ICSRs are specific to an individual, identifiable patient and may contain more than one ADE. There are two types of ICSRs. Expedited ICSRs, also called 15-day alert reports, and non-expedited or periodic ICSRs. In this slide, we'll discuss how to determine uh, the reporting of these ICSRs. Expedited ICSRs include serious and new safety information and are due to FDA within 15 days of receipt of the ADE information. As you see on the top box, for application products and unapproved prescription drugs, firms have 15 calendar days. Whereas for OTC monograph products, firms have 15 business days. It's important to note that the source and evaluation of ADEs also impacts reporting. For example, spontaneous ADEs received from anywhere in the world that are serious and unexpected are expedited. However, for solicited sources, only serious and unexpected ADEs that are also evaluated as possibly related are expedited. In the second box, you'll note that all serious domestic ADEs for OTC monograph products are expedited, regardless of expectedness and relatedness. Non-expedited ADEs include known or non-serious safety information. It's important to evaluate which non-expedited ADEs qualify for reporting to FDA in periodic ICSRs, because not all non-expedited ADEs are reportable. For application products, spontaneous ADEs that are expected or non-serious must be submitted. However, periodic reporting does not apply to non-expedited ADEs that come from the literature, solicited sources, or foreign sources. Additionally, periodic reporting does not apply to unapproved drugs. ADEs received from any source must be promptly reviewed. When reviewing ADEs, consider what additional information is needed to evaluate the case. For example, missing information about the identifiable patient, suspect drug, or adverse event should actively be sought. Additionally, expedited ADEs must be investigated to further understand the clinical incident and outcome. Firms <clears throat> must maintain records documenting their attempts to obtain additional information, even if they are unsuccessful. Evaluation also encompasses assessing ADEs for reportability to FDA, as discussed on the previous slide. The date when the four minimal data elements are available is considered the initial date of receipt for reporting purposes. While firms investigate ADEs, the initial report should still be processed in order to meet the required timeframes for reporting. In summary, written procedures for evaluation should describe who evaluates the ADEs, how the need for follow-up and follow-up attempts are documented, 
how, and how evaluations of reportability are made and documented. And the last step of our process for surveillance receipt evaluation and reporting is reporting. So firms must have written procedures for reporting ADE information to FDA. This section covers different aspects of what needs to be included, how to report to FDA, and what written procedures need to address. So who's responsible? Both application holders and non-applicants listed on product labels as manufacturers, packers, or distributors have paid reporting responsibilities. Applicants have to report expedited ADEs to FDA within 15 days. However, non-applicants listed on the label have a choice. They can either report all serious ADEs to the applicant within five calendar days, and then the applicant handles it from there, or they can send the expedited ADEs directly to FDA within 15 days. Written procedures should address the method and timeframes for reporting ADEs to FDA or the applicants. Additionally, if firms have any business arrangements with other firms, written procedures and pharmacovigilance agreements should clearly address who has ADE reporting responsibilities. <clears throat> Regardless of the type of product, firms must submit ICSRs to FDA containing ADE information. Firms that hold NDAs, ANDAs, and BLAs must also submit aggregate reports of safety information. That's shown on the left of this chart. There are two types of aggregate reports, annual reports and periodic safety reports. Periodic safety reports include the Periodic Adverse Drug Experience Report, or PADER, as described in the CFR. However, FDA also grants waivers allowing firms to submit periodic safety information in the Periodic Benefit Risk Evaluation Report format. Please note that annual reports and periodic safety reports are two different submissions, and application or license holders are required to submit both. On inspection, we do note that some firms only submit one of these. Per the electronic reporting rule, all submissions to FDA, including the ICSRs and aggregate reports, must be in an electronic format that FDA can process, review, and archive. As mentioned on the previous slide, all ICSR submissions to FDA must be in an approved electronic format. The options are to submit in E2B format over the electronic submission gateway or via an internet-based form on the safety reporting portal. You'll hear more about electronic reporting later this session. ICSRs become reportable to FDA when the four basic data elements are known. This table describes the reporting requirements for ICSRs. For application and unapproved prescription drugs, firms must submit expedited ICSRs to FDA within 15 calendar days of receipt of initial and follow-up information. For application products only, firms must submit non-expedited ICSRs with the next periodic safety report. Firms also have the option to submit non-expedited ICSRs on a rolling basis on or before the due date of the next periodic safety report. For OTC monograph products, Firms must submit all serious domestic ADEs to FDA within 15 business days of receipt. Any follow-up information received within one year of the initial report must also be submitted within 15 business days of receipt. For OTC monograph products, non-serious ADEs do not need to be submitted to FDA. Written procedures should describe the method, timing, and documentation for both expedited and periodic ICSR submission to FDA. In addition to ICSRs, firms are also required to submit aggregate safety reports to FDA for approved NDAs, ANDAs, and BLAs. Both of these reports must be submitted for approved products, even if the product is not being marketed. For electronic submissions, it's important to note that the annual report and the paters are submitted to the ECTD. However, the individual ICSRs must be submitted via the Electronic Submission Gateway or Safety Reporting Portal. One common observation is that companies may send everything, including the ICSRs, to the ECTD, which is not an approved format for ICSRs. This table summarizes the two types of aggregate reports. The annual report is a summary of clinical information that the applicant has to submit every year within 60 days of the U.S. approval date. This report is not specific to post-marketing studies since it also includes summaries of their ongoing clinical trials. 
In contrast, the PATER is a periodic report that specifically summarizes post-marketing safety information. It is submitted quarterly for the first three years and annually thereafter. The quarterly reports are due within 30 days of the close of the quarter, and the annual reports are due within 60 days of the U.S. approval date. Written procedures should address the creation, review, timeframes, and submission to FDA for these aggregate reports. Finally, firms may request waivers that allow them to deviate from certain paid regulations. Waivers are specific to an application, meaning that if the product transfers firms, the waiver stays with it. Some common waivers are listed here for your reference. I'll now turn it over to Richard Abate, who will discuss business relationships. Hi, my name is Rick Abate, and I'm the team leader for the paid compliance team. And we're going to talk about business relationships and, and agreements. So we're moving on to business relationships that affect the process and flow of post-marketing drug safety information. We find it a common business practice for responsible firms to hire contractors that specialize in pharmacovigilance activities to, to complete the required functions of surveillance, receipt, evaluation, and reporting of post-marketing drug safety information. As the current regulations are silent on this practice, you may think, what compliance issues could we see with these activities when these activities are outsourced? The main issue that arises from this practice is the responsible firm maintaining oversight of the activities completed by the pharmacovigilance vendors. The next slide will discuss the importance of this issue. When any step of the pharmacovigilance process while any, when any step can be uh, contracted out, the paid regulations do not provide for the transfer of pharmacovigilance responsibilities to the contractors. In other words, the applicant holder or non-applicant named on the label remains responsible for compliance with the paid regulations. It is my experience that all pharmacovigilance vendors do not provide the same level of service. We have seen applicant holders relying only on the vendor for paid co compliance. This has resulted in observations and warning letters in the past. Therefore, it is in the responsible firm's best interest to maintain oversight of the contractor and build that oversight into your work agreements or contracts. Should the pharmacovigilance vendor fall out of compliance with the U.S. paid regulations, the regulatory consequences may fall back to the responsible firm. Another type of affiliation that impacts safety data is business partners, including but not limited to contracted manufacturers, labelers, or distributors. Business partners are a potential source of safety data for drug and biologic products. Business partner relationships come in many forms. The trend for industry to jointly develop and market drugs means that more, more than one firm's information may appear on a product label. The, man, the manufacturer may be contracted and the name appear on the label. Distributors' names may appear on the product labels. Further, a firm may purchase an application from the original applicant holder, but the drug safety database is not transferred due to rest of world marketing by the original holder. Drug safety data that is collected must transfer between business partners or be submitted to FDA directly. Specifically, the regulations and statutes listed on this slide provide the requirements for the transfer, evaluation, and records retention of safety data between persons named on product labels. Contracted manufacturers, labelers, or distributors whose name appear on the labels are considered a source of safety data. There must be written procedures also referred to as agreements, contracts, or work orders with business partners who may receive drug safety data. These agreements may be referred to as drug safety data, drug safety data exchange agreements or pharmacovigilance agreements. The agreements facilitate the exchange of safety information between business partners to best ensure the required safety data is provided to FDA and, if warranted, 
to each other. Because business relationships differ, there is no one-size-fits-all pharmacovigilance agreement. However, specific areas should be covered in these documents, and this is what we look for when we're reviewing them. And I'll be discussing this over the next few slides. The first area is the types of data being exchanged. For example, is it all ADEs or adverse drug experiences or just the serious ones, which are provided for in the noted regulation? Also, the agreement should address how the sending party knows that the data was received, and vice versa. How does the receiving party know that they have received all the relevant safety data the sending party has to provide? Additionally, the timeliness of the exchange of safety information should be included. Non-applicants must submit all serious ADEs to the applicant holder within five days if they are not submitting 15-day alerts that they receive directly to FDA. This regulation is intended to provide for the applicant to have sufficient time to evaluate and report 15-day alert ICSRs in a timely manner. We have also seen applicant holders contract business partners or other, other affiliates more experienced in creating periodic aggregate safety reports, such as PADERS or PEBERS, to prepare the required documents. Therefore, these contracts should include, when relevant, the applicant holder providing safety data for these aggregate reports in time for the preparation and timely submission. Business partners should ensure the terms of these pharmacovigilance agreements are met by including, as part of the agreement, routine reconciliation of data, having meetings to discuss the safety data regularly, or scheduling audits of safety data held by business partners. The business partner not meeting the terms of the pharmacovigilance agreement could result in an applicant holder or other responsible person's non-compliance with the paid reporting requirements. I therefore recommend that firms consider including plans for corrective actions when non-compliance of agreements is identified. As I noticed previous, previously, we have seen the preparation of periodic safety reports contracted out to business affiliates. While these business affiliates may be more experienced in the preparation and submission of these reports, it is again important to remember that applicant holders remain responsible for the compliance of the content of these aggregate safety reports. Therefore, we encourage applicant holders maintain oversight of these reports. We suggest perhaps maybe reviewing the content before it is submitted to the FDA. Finally, we see contracted business affiliates or pharmacovigilance contractors submitting drug safety reports, either individual case safety reports or the aggregate periodic safety reports, on the applicant holder's behalf. When these activities are contracted out, the agreement should be specific as to when the reports need to be submitted. The format and the method of submission to FDA and the tracking of FDA submission confirmation. Based on U.S. regulation, the applicant holder is ultimately responsible for the content and timely submission of safety reports submitted to FDA for approved products. Next up is Sarenjan Day, the, direct, the Deputy Director of the Regulatory Science Staff in the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Today I'm going to talk about uh, electronic reporting of individual case safety reports. Uh, we heard all about the regulations, now I'm going to see how uh, a firm would submit this uh, ICSRs. So we're going to understand in the electronic reporting of individual case safety report, in my talk, uh, to outline the topics I have. Uh, we first need to understand what FAERS is, which stands for FDA Adverse Event Reporting System, uh, why we need the electronic ICSR submission, and the submission methods, the submission of periodic safety reports, and then the future state of electronic submissions. And then we'll go see some references. So what is FAERS? 
So FAIRS is FDA's post-market safety surveillance database for drugs and therapeutic biologics. And it's this database is used to monitor uh, safety data for to analyze, monitor, and, and identify adverse event and medication errors. Uh, FDA staff in CEDAR and both CEDAR and CBER, they regularly examine this FAIRS database as part of their routine safety monitoring. And when a safety signal is identified uh, from FAIRS data, it is then um, further, it's then taken for further evaluation. <clears throat> so FAIRS is our FDA's uh, adverse event reporting database. So this is all this where all the data which is submitted comes and resides in FAIRS. So let's see how it comes into FAIRS. So, so post-marketing day adverse event report in uh, is comes from patient, consumers, or healthcare professionals. They are uh, voluntary report, uh, voluntary reporting of safety reports. Uh, these voluntary reports either come to MedWatch. Once they come to MedWatch, they are manually entered and gets into a FAIRS database. If these reports, uh, which are voluntary uh, reported, goes to the manufacturer, then the regulations come into place and these reports are then submitted by the manufacturer uh, electronically to FDA. So 95% of our uh, safety reports come from manufacturers and then about 5% uh, from consumers and healthcare professionals. Okay, uh, next, uh, what are these reports we have in FAIRS database? So we have reports for medication errors, uh, adverse events, and product problem resulting in, uh, in an adverse event. And these are for drugs and therapeutic biologics, for CEDAR, and then we also keep uh, tissue products, therapeutic blood products for CBER in the FAIRS database. All right. <clears throat> So what are the requirements for uh, electronic reporting? So <clears throat> the first uh, requirement is we submit uh, safety reports in an electronic format so that FDA can process, review, and archive. Next is to improve the agency's uh, system of collecting and analyzing uh, post-marketing safety reports. It also helps to enable agency to more rapidly review post-marketing safety reports, identify and eva evaluate emerging safety problems, and then disseminate the information in support of FDA's public health mission. And then finally, uh, the electronic submission also enhances uh, global pharmacovigilance because now you, have, you can have uh, electronic transmission and exchange of appropriate information using a common data standard and data elements and transmissions methods and standards. Uh, the regulation for uh, the electronic reporting uh, is available in the Federal Register. Here's the link below. Uh, and now we'll see how these reports can get into fairs and how these reports can be submitted by firms and look at the submission methods. So going to the next slide, we'll see that there are two options for uh, submitting ICSRs. One you see at the top, which is the safety reporting portal, and at the bottom, which is through the database to database transmission through E2B standard, which is the ICH E2B standard. So looking at the database to database, uh, this standard we use the ICH E2B uh, M or the R2 data standards. Uh, we have uh, a few regional requirements in there and that can be found in one of the references. Uh, these ICSRs are submitted in XML format and then attachments must be in the PDF format. And the attachments are basically if you have a literature report, you have the literature article which you need to submit and they uh, must be submitted separately from the XML. 
Uh, the safety reporting portal. So this is a portal website. It's a web-based uh, uh, form. In first, in order to access this form, uh, or <coughs> you have to log in. And in order to log in, uh, the best way is to submit a email to affairsesub at fda.hhs.gov. It's also available. Information is also available on the fda.gov website. Now, what does the portal do? The portal is a web-based screen. Uh, it enables uh, direct access to submit a report directly from the portal. It's based on the MedWatch form. Uh, you don't users don't have to have gateway partnership, and uh, attachments can be directly attached uh, to the report and then submitted. <clears throat> In both cases, when you submit the report, you have uh, for the E2B, you get an acknowledgement back. Typically, these acknowledgements come in about two hours from your submission. And the acknowledgement will say it's a positive acknowledgement or a negative acknowledgement. Positive acknowledgement indicates that the report was accepted. And the negative acknowledgement that's that there was some errors in that report. Uh, typically, for gateway submission, you get two acknowledgement. The first one is that the the, uh, the firm has submitted to the FDA ESG, which is the Enterprise Submission Gateway. You get the first acknowledgement, which is also called the MDN. And then finally, once FAIRS accepts it, you get the second acknowledgement, which says that the data was uh, accepted. From the safety reporting portal, that's, uh, that's much more easier because you have a web-based form. And at the end, there's a Submit button. You click on the Submit button, and it tells you the report was submitted successfully, and that becomes your FDA uh, submission date. So the safety reporting portal uh, on the left-hand side, if you see, uh, it's the, there's a login screen. And uh, if you don't have an account, it will ask you to request uh, to an email uh, to FDA for an account request. And once the account has been created, uh, an email will go get out to the go out to the users, and uh, they can then change their password and start submitting a report. Oh, one important thing to note that if you are in the safety reporting portal, if you want to submit through that, it takes about seven business days to get an account. So if you have a report which you know you're going to be submitting, or you know that your product just got approved, and now you're going to have the first uh, adverse event report. Uh, please request for an account way ahead of time so that you have the account and not scrambling at the last moment to submit that report. So submitting uh, uh, periodic safety reports, these are to be submitted, the individual ICSR are to be submitted to FAIRS um, and, the, and the descriptive portion to ECTD. And you could submit the, the ICSRs in an ongoing basis and not have to wait for uh, the 60, 90 day period. And one most important thing to note that when a report is submitted, an initial report, the safety report number which you use, you should continue to use the same safety report number the life of the case, which means every follow up should maintain the same safety report number because the safety report number is the number which is used for. FDA to determine if it's an initial report or a follow-up report. So if the number changes, then the system will look for that number. If it does not find, then FAIRS will create a new safety report number. Finally, the future state. We would, uh, FDA plans to uh, get onto the ICH E2B R3. Uh, we have posted on June 23rd, 2016, uh, the technical regional implementation specification. Uh, as we go through the implementation, the specification definitely will have some uh, updates. Uh, this specification actually has the core ICH E2B R3 uh, data points along with few regional elements, and the regional elements are listed below, like rate, ethnicity and uh, drug descriptors like combination and compounding flags. Uh, so as we go through, we are going to have uh, sessions which we used to have when we did E2B R2. They are called EPROMP meetings. 
and this will probably happen four times in a year where uh, FR notice will go out for invitations and the idea is to discuss the R3 implementation with sponsors or firms uh, so that the implementation is uh, goes in smooth. Finally, I just have two uh, questions to ask uh, based on the talk which I had given today. And the first question is a method of submitting ICSRs, database to database, safety reporting portal, paper med watch, or D is A and B. So give you a few seconds to for folks to answer. Okay. So the answer is uh, right. We have A and B. So you have you can do through safety reporting portal and through or through the database to database. Next question: True or false? Periodic reports are comprised of two parts, the descriptive portion and the non-expedited ICSRs. And the answer is true. So it has two parts, descriptive portion, which is to be submitted to the ECTD, and the non-expedited ICSRs, which are to be submitted to FAIRS, either through the safety reporting portal or through uh, the E2B method. Finally, these are all the references of uh, most of the topics which I talked today. Uh, these are all referenced here, how electronic submission is to be done, what are the rules, the specification, how do you prepare your ICSRs, and, and then how do you submit to the ECTD. So with that, I will hand it over to Ray for the questions and answer sessions. Thank you. This is Commander Ray Ford. We'll now transition into our first Q&A panel. We invite you to continue submitting your questions, identifying the relevant speaker. We'll begin in a few moments. Thank you for your patience. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. This is Diane Bruce answering questions about surveillance and receipt 
um, for written procedures. The first question we received is, states, if we do not know if a patient received or did not receive a drug, but an adverse event is reported to the applicant, should we consider this a valid report and should it be submitted? So if you have an identifiable patient, a suspect drug, an identifiable reporter, and an adverse event, the report is considered a valid ADE and should be evaluated for reporting to FDA. If any of the information that you require is missing, you should attempt to obtain this information and document all your follow-up attempts. The next question we've received um, asks, are the sponsors required to monitor fares for their products? The answer to this is no. Thank you, Diane. This is uh, Namita Katari, and I'm going to answer uh, some of the questions we, we received about evaluation and reporting. Um, so in the first question, someone asked, if a drug is marketed, then do the applicants submit payers and annual reports? And the answer is yes. Firms must submit payers and annual reports for all approved NDAs, ANDAs, and BLA products, regardless of their marketing status. Uh, in the next question, someone asked, what are PSRs and what is their frequency of submission? So PSRs are our general broad term that we use to as periodic safety report, and it covers two types of periodic safety reports. The first one is the PADER, the Periodic Adverse Drug Experience Report, which is in the US FDA as the CFR. And the second one is the is an internationally used format called the P PBRER, the Periodic Benefit Risk Evaluation Report. And the frequency, by default, uh, for what's provided in our CFR, is that it's based on the US approval date. And firms have to submit the payers quarterly for the first three years and annually after that. However, firms can apply for a waiver if they want to submit it based on a different date, for example, the international birth date. And they can also submit a waiver to submit it at, di at a different frequency. For example, we see waivers for every six months. Um, we received another question um, regarding ICSR submissions. If an MAH submits ICSRs, 15-day alert reports, on day 15 electronically, but receives submission acknowledgement from the FDA on day 16 or later, will this report be considered as late by FDA? And the answer is no. The firm should maintain documentation of when the ICSR was submitted to FDA, and that's what we'd look at. Um, we received another question about um, receiving an adverse event report with multiple drugs. So in this question, many times a patient is receiving several drugs. However, a firm receives an ADE just listing their drug only. How do they firm, however, they firmly believe that it is not due to any of the other co-administered drugs and just their drug only. Please suggest a path forward. So this question really highlights the importance of having written procedures for um, evaluation because it depends on whether or not this report came in through a spontaneous pathway or a solicited pathway. For spontaneous reports, there's an implied causality that the reporter believes that the drug caused the adverse event and that's why they're reporting it to you. So all serious and unexpected ADs from spontaneous sources are expeditable. However, if it is solicited, then the firm does have to make a causality assessment and only report cases that they believe are possibly related to their drug as expedited reports. And so those are uh, some of the questions we received. We're going to turn it over to Rick Abate to answer some of the business relationship questions. Thanks, Namita. Uh, the first question I have is pretty simple. Uh, can SDAs and PVAs or pharmacovigilance agreements be included in a quali quality technical agreement? And the answer is yes, they can. However you uh, want, wish to do that and make it as simple as possible, that is, that is pop you could do that. Um, another question is, does email confirmation of receipt count as reconciliation? Um, I, I kind of that depends. If it's an automatic receipt, I would not necessarily say that's a yes. Uh, if you get a, somebody who actually has seen it and responded to you, then I would consider that to be reconciliation because there's a person involved looking at the information that you're sending. Um, then that there's two questions I'm going to kind of combine because they're related. 
so it says is if a non-applicant sends an expedited report to an applicant within five days, does the applicant have 10 or 15 days to submit to FDA? The clock starts when the ADE is received. So if the non-applicant and the applicant are have business affiliates, it's the date the clock starts when the non-applicant receives it, and therefore um, there's a total. The column, this, they would have 10 days after they get it uh, if the non-applicant submitted it at five days. So the total clock is 15 days uh, from when the non-applicant receives it. Um, however, you will see situations where non-business affiliates will send you a 15-day alert report. If a non-business affiliate sends you a, a, a uh, 15 day alert report, then it's your receive date. So it's your date of awareness is when your your clock starts. Sarenjan, you want to answer some questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Like I have the most number. <laughs> All right. So first question: uh, How does uh, pharma access fares? Uh, is this a subscription or a cost? So, uh, based on this presentation, uh, of course, uh, we didn't talk anything about uh, about this part. But uh, but fares uh, FT actually has three methods. One is the fares public dashboard, which was launched last year September. Uh, it has got data from 1968 to March 31st, 2018. Um, this is a very interactive dashboard, and uh, and once you go into the dashboard, you will be able to search for your product, and then be able to see line listing. These line listing also can now be downloaded, um, and if and if you need more detailed information about the safety reports, then uh, the best way is to do a Freedom of Information Act FOIA request. Uh, please note that all the, this data which is in the dashboard is redacted, so which means a very limited number of data fields are, uh, are posted. The same the similar kind of data fields are also available in what we call as a quarterly data extract. These are uh, E2B XML files or ASCII files, and then finally we have the Open FDA. Uh, where which uh, you can do some some level of search and then download the data in a JSON format. Uh, another question: uh, Can SRP be used as a disaster disaster recovery recovery uh, business continuity system for applicants submitting electronically via E2B? Uh, and the answer is: Once uh, a, a firm has moved into E2B, they cannot go back to the safety reporting portal. Uh, a next question is a firm is transitioning from SRP to E2B. Any recommendation? Uh, so the website uh, FTA.gov and our website electronic reporting has got the steps of how to transition over uh, the accounts you need to get. And if you're through a partner or a CRO, then the kind of um, they will probably have an account. You have need to test your files. And if you have any questions, you can submit that to fairs, esub at fd.hhs.gov. Uh, another question is, uh, if an ICSR is uploaded to SRP, does it also need to be included in the pater? And the answer is no. Uh, and I would take two more questions. Uh, there's one question which talks about uh, uh, for where is there a similar portal? There is a site where uh, application which companies can download called eSubmitter uh, because where only accepts uh, E2B R3 and that can be then uh, submitted by uh, uh, used uh, and downloaded. The software can be downloaded and then you can submit an ICSR for where. And I think these are the questions. Uh, some of the questions which I have, we need to get back to you. Thank you. Hi, this is Namita again. Keep the questions coming. Um, we have a few more. Uh, the next one is, what is the reporting category 
for foreign ADEs, which are serious and unexpected, is it 15 day or pater or none? And we've had a couple questions like this. So for foreign ADEs, if it is a serious and unexpected ADE, it is reportable as a 15 day alert report. If it is not serious and unexpected, there is no requirement to report that to FDA for, for ADEs arising from foreign sources. In another question, we have, do generic sponsors have to perform scientific literature searches for ADEs? Uh, literature searching is not required. However, if you do it and you become aware of an ADE, you have to handle it um, as an ADE. So as a reminder, any ADE that is serious and unexpected from the literature is reportable as an expedited report. If it is not serious and unexpected, then it is not reportable to FDA. All right, I can just take two more. Uh, one question here for non serious ADA should be submitted in next payer report and not through SRP. Uh, what format it has to be submitted through ESG? So, all individual ICSRs must be submitted either through the SRP or through ESG. If you're submitting through ESG, then the format is to use the ICH E2B R2 format. And is there a date that R3 will be mandatory for FDA submission? So we FDA has still not started the implementation for E2B R3. Um, I think the three organizations I know who have started is Europe, Japan, yeah, Europe and Japan. Um, so FDA is still yet to start the implementation, so we don't have any 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 timeline uh, set for when it's going to be mandatory. Thank you. Okay, now we'll turn it over to uh, Rick Tate. Okay, we have a few more questions. Um, there's a question about should requests for waivers to submit papers be submitted to the NDA or to the Office of Compliance? Um, they can be submitted through the NDA, but they have to be submitted addressed to the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology in CEDAR to be considered. Um, they they uh, approve the waivers for post-marketing um, adverse drug experience reports. Uh, so there's a question of whether a payer and an annual and an annual report are different documents. And yes, they are different documents. One is covered under 31480-23C, uh, and the other one is covered under 31481B. So they're two different. They cover. They're covered under two different uh, regulations, and the content of each is discussed in each regulation. Um, the, there's a question about any update on reporting requirements for drug device combination products per, per uh, 21 CFR Part 4 Subpart B. And I direct you to your screen. The first guidance that's on there is the compliance policy for combination products post-marketing uh, reporting, uh, safety reporting. Click on that, and that will take you to the uh, most recent guidance that was published. Just a reminder, if your question was not addressed, please resend to Cedar SBIA at fda.hhs.gov. We'll now take a short 10 minute break and start session two at 1115. 